dollars, twenty five million dollars. The let's uh, do you want to go ahead and move to uh, the Vikings? Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and do that. The Minnesota Vikings had fifteen draft picks in this draft. A little, little strange. The Saints wanted to move up in one round, and they traded the rest of their draft. Yeah. It was. Uh, was it the fifth round or fourth round? I think it was fourth. And it was, and then so the Saints traded every pick they had backwards. Yeah, yeah. They so uh, most of these players will not make the roster. No, 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 no. Uh, the Vikings needed cornerback, wide receiver, and offensive line help. Uh, they got basically <laughs> all of it. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, it, you know, they they needed a wide receiver. They went and got Justin Jefferson. Uh, they also got KJ Osborne out of Miami. Yep. They, uh, you know, they they drafted him another quarterback with Nate Stanley late, late, late. Um, yeah, that was a late pick. I don't know that that's it. It's just back up. Yeah, and it's and I mean I don't know that he's going to make the roster, but uh, but you know they got Cam Dantzler, uh cornerback out of Mississippi State, who I think is an absolute stud. Uh, yeah, I thought I thought he was a good pickup. I, I do believe um, they got you know, Ezra Cleveland in the second round, and I thought he was a first round quality offensive lineman. The problem was just too many offensive linemen. This was one of the best offensive line drafts we've had in a long time. Yeah, I agree. I agree. They, um, I'll, I'll say this. They got cornerback Jeff Gladney out of TCU. They drafted him in the first round. I, I think that was a little bit of a reach. I mean, maybe they saw more out of him than, I mean, obviously they did, uh, than, than I saw, but I, I, I mean, I watched multiple TCU games this year. Nothing he did stood out to me. He got burned a lot. And, yeah, if you're watching ESPN, obviously they're going to show you his highlight reel. You know, you can make a highlight reel for basically anybody. Yeah. But he did not impress me at all at TCU. It It was amazing to me to see how many guys got drafted out of TCU. Like, I understand that you especially want defensive guys out of Gary Patterson's system, but I just I didn't understand. So here's what I equate that record to for the last two years, especially. Turnovers, and none of these players yeah. have anything to do with that. That's true, but it, it's – they. No, I mean, because we're not talking about a little bit of turnovers. Oh, I understand, I understand. Let but the it, NCAA two years in a row in turnovers – and we're talking about fumbles, interceptions, everything. That's yeah. all from the quarterback. You know, quarterback's not getting drafted. The rest of these guys are good. Yeah. You just can't overturn, overcome turnovers. I, I, I thought they didn't get blown out in a lot of these games, Gary. They were no, in a lot. Of these they games. were, yeah, they were in a lot of the them. Other team just, got two or three extra possessions. That sucks. Yeah, when you get when you get the extra possessions, yeah. If they beat Texas, if they beat Oklahoma, if they beat some of these games where turnovers are the only reason they lost them. We look at this team completely different. That's true. Uh, they did, have, but now I'm a little biased here because I love Gary Patterson. I, I will tell you, a lot more offensive players got drafted than I thought from TCU. I always would trust drafting a defensive player um, from from a from a team with a coach like Gary Patterson because I know the guy is going to come into the league and I'm not going to have to worry about his intelligence. That's, I'm not going to have to worry about teaching him the game of football. In college, you can be a freak athlete, and you could just out-athlete a lot of guys, especially at skill positions, especially at a position like safety and cornerback. Yeah, um, You can just go out there and be an athlete and not have to think they're going to play a man-to-man on somebody or they're going to play a zone and you see the ball, get the ball, and that's just kind of the, the way you've been coached up. There are a few coaches, Gary Patterson is absolutely one of them, where they come out and you know – they're going to know how to read NFL defenses, uh, offenses. They're going to know how to scheme. They're going to know how to prepare mentally for the game. And so if they physically can play, they've got that much of a leg up, and the learning curve is a lot smaller for them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Uh, fourth- I think that's why so many defensive players come from TCU in this draft is, you know, we didn't get to see these guys close. They didn't get one-on-one workouts the way they wanted to. And so – I'm just going with a coach that I trust. I, I know this guy can learn our defensive playbook and can learn what we want to do because he's been in a scheme that's complex and complicated already. Yeah, 
That's a, and that's a very valid point, especially for a Mike Zimmer defense. I mean, hundred percent. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, because as Saban is the same thing. The quality of players is a lot better. Yeah, he's but, he's undersized. Know, it, um, it, Carlos Gomez but, jumps in on YouTube. He said, "Glad he's undersized at five ten. Not sure if they're going to play him in the slider outside. Uh, the other guy on the outside for the Vikings, Mike Hughes, is unproven. So yeah, Hughes yeah. Hughes the second guy. Uh, Mike and second guy Hughes is is. He's good. He's fine. He's he's he would scare me to be my second only guy. Yeah. Um, I I don't know, man. I just I think there are some coaches that they you know the league just trust them to be smart players. Yeah, and that's and that's what we got here. And let, let's talk about their fourth round, which they murdered their fourth <laughs> round. It was awesome. Uh, yeah. They got DJ Wanham, uh, edge rusher out of South Carolina. They got another edge rusher, James Lynch, out of Baylor. Who honestly, people were talking about him as possibly a a sleeper first rounder, you know, during the college football season. Now, obviously, these two guys are as athletic out. as anybody else, and oh, they yeah. they get into a pro system, they're they're going to be just fine. Oh yeah, and they also got linebacker Troy Die out of Oregon, and he was a stud for the Ducks last year. So yeah. they, I mean, they killed it in their draft. Now, obviously, you get more bites at the apple, uh, you're going to do all right. You know, we, we've talked about that before. It's what the Patriots have always done. Um, yeah. You get more bites at the apple. You get more opportunities. You know, I mean, they, they drafted, let's see, one, two, three edge rushers in this draft. They uh, they got Ezra Cleveland. They got Cam Dantzler. They got uh, cornerback Harrison Hand out of Temple, who, by the way, they got him in the fifth round. Harrison Hand could be better than Jeff Gladney. Don't, I'm just saying it's a possibility because I think the kid's got insane talent. Uh I mean, they they basically cleaned up in this draft, uh, and it's easier when you got fifteen picks. I get that in this, yeah. But they didn't have all those picks until the third day. No, and I understand that. But what I'm saying is, they already had a lot of picks anyway, um, because they they had two in the first, they had one in the second, one in the third, and then they had three in the fourth, two in the fifth, two in the sixth, and then four in the seventh. So all of that from rounds uh, four on. Like, honestly, they had most of the fourth-round picks already. Yeah, that's like, right. No, you're right. They everything trade trade. later got added because of the, the Saints trade. Saints trade, yeah. So, you know, I I thought they killed it early. Like, they no, really I, got value no, they, picks there. Yeah, but no, I thought they did the same thing. So, if we picked a winner of this conference, this division, there's no question it's the Vikings. Oh, it's the it's Vikings. Not close either. Yeah, it's not even close. I would actually struggle picking a loser here. Because I don't like what any of the other three. The pro, I'm going to take the Bears out. They probably did the second best out of this four teams. I just can't trust any decision they've made because I can't trust their trigger man. It's just hard to grade them. No, you're right. You're right. The other that. two, I think the dudes for the uh, for the Lions are going to be better pros and be in the league longer. But I don't know that that means they're winners because. It's just hard to quantify who should they have taken other than Swift because they have other needs. And then what would that team look like if they plugged those guys in those situations? Yeah. That's, I, I, I get where you're coming from. I get where so, you're coming from. Who would you say um, the loser is in this division? I mean, I'm probably going to go Packers. Like, I, I just I, – I understand, like, I, I didn't really like what the Bears did. I didn't really like what the Lions did. But – I think, I think the Packers are probably the answer. Also, I, I think the, the Packers. AJ Dillon pick is is almost unexcusable. Yeah, that's that's bad. The Jordan Love if thing, that, it's it's if, hit or miss. But you've got a franchise think, quarterback that has four years left on his deal, and I understand. You know, we can have all the arguments that we want, but if you are really behind your quarterback and you understand that your number one need, based on last season, is wide receiver, and you don't, and and instead the. I mean, they could have gotten him offensive line help. They could have uh, helped out with the defense. They could have they could have done any number of things. That's right. And instead, they picked the one position that is going to infuriate their most vocal leader. That is just insane to me. Why you would do that? Like all you're doing is causing trouble. You know that's that's what it felt like. So, and we can see what ends up happening with it. My only my only thought is is they have more information than we do on Rodgers. I mean it, that's that's. The I mean they're the thing. only ones that truly know his medical, and if they don't think he's going to last the four year contract, then 
at some point in time, it is responsible. This is why I like going back three years and five years and seeing who really won the draft and who really lost the draft. Because today we can think these things. But if A.J. Dillon becomes the next Adrian Peterson and Jordan Love somehow gets the job because Rodgers breaks a collarbone or misses a game for a whatever, and he becomes Tom Brady, and sorry, you just don't get your job back, then they look like geniuses and we look like fools. That happens more times than not. So yeah. that's it's, it. it's why I like going back. I, I would like once we're done with all of this, if we struggle to find something to talk about, I'd really like to rehash maybe the first or second round of, you know, the draft from three years ago and the draft from five years ago, just to see how well, these teams these, really do. Yeah. How did they actually do? Uh, let me, let me read you what they said about the Jordan love pick on pro football focus. This is Seth Galena. He said, uh, what makes this move even more curious is that Rogers isn't at the end of his contract in green Bay. He signed a monster four year extension in August, 2018 restructured it as recently as December, 2019. He is under that contract until 2023, though there is a potential out in the deal before that. Critically, that massive overlap also means that Love's value is capped as long as Rodgers is ahead of him on the depth chart. When Rodgers and Favre overlapped, it predated the CBA that made the most powerful thing in football a good quarterback on his rookie deal. Even if Jordan Love becomes a great succession plan to Rodgers down the road, the Packers will have burned most, if not all, of the rookie contract that would have made him such a huge advantage. The yep. other issue is that Jordan Love is a massive gamble, even in a vacuum in the first round. PFF had already written that he simply isn't worth the gamble of a first-round pick and that the volatility, uh, volatility and downside to his game is too great to justify chasing his big playability. For Love, it is perhaps the perfect landing spot because he will get multiple seasons to work on his game with zero threat of having to start and lead a team while he does it. For Rodgers and a team that went to a conference championship game mere months ago, it is a total waste of impact in 2020. That's what makes it so insane. So I, I'm going to disagree with a major part of what they said. They said that he was undrafted in the first round because of his volatility, because of his lack of proven, you know, whatever. He's such a risk. Yeah. And, and I just disagree there. Certain teams can do that and certain teams can't. If you have a lot of holes to fill, then you can't be taking risk with your first pick and you can't be taking those gambles. But, but if you're the Saints and you think you've got a short-lived quarterback or you're the Colts and you've got a short-lived quarterback, absolutely, man. Let her rip. Yeah. and that's Go it's get a boomer bust guy because if he busts, the rest of your team is really good. This is so the to same say that thing nobody that, should have taken him in the first round is wrong. It, this is the same thing that Packers people said about, uh, about Patrick Mahomes. It's the same thing. Yeah. You, can't, yeah. you just can't blanket say that. I vehemently disagree – with the Lions in the second round taking Delonte, uh, Dante Swift. Right? Dante Swift, yeah. yeah. But I love, I loved that the Chiefs took one of the big three running backs with their first pick. Why is that? Because those two teams ain't the same. Yeah. yeah. One team had a undrafted running back that had looked good, but there's nothing elite or, you know, dynamic about Williams even though he probably should have been the Super Bowl MVP. But, you know, that, that was, that's a great game, and that's awesome. That doesn't mean he's worthy of that position the entire next year. And they went and said, dude, we, we don't have a lot of needs. Let's fill this need with, a, you know, with a star. Yeah. Okay? That's, that's how one team can take somebody, and another team can take the same somebody. And one I like a lot, and the other I hate. Because they don't all fit. No, you're right about that. This is very much a puzzle. And if pieces don't fit, then it just doesn't work. No, you're you're dead on. You're dead on. All right, anything else that we need to hit on uh, today? That's it, brother. So we went a little long, but that's all right. We had much to discuss. It's a Monday show. That's the way these things uh, handle sometimes. So I'm going to go finish drinking my tequila faux show. And, uh, and, of course, if you would so kindly share the show out, tell your buddies about it if you appreciate uh, what we're doing we always appreciate your support. Uh, if you will, make sure and join us again tomorrow. We're going to have a good time. I'll guarantee it. We're going to get into the AFC North, I believe. Is that right, Chris? Yep. AFC North tomorrow. Uh, till then, everybody be kind and be good to each other. We'll see you then. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. 
If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com, or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show.